بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, On behalf of the masjid, I would like to uh, welcome you all to this week's Saturday lecture uh, that will be delivered by Sheikh Abu Usama and the topic of today's lecture will be death. But before we make a start, inshallah, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, firstly, if we can ask the brothers inshallah to settle down uh, and also move as far forward towards the stage as possible, inshallah ta'ala. Also, if you can ask the brothers inshallah and the sisters uh, to remain silent throughout the lecture, inshallah, so not to disturb, inshallah, anyone else. And also, if you have phones, which I'm sure you do, put them on silent or switch them off. Also, for those of you who have brought your children, can you please keep your children with you? Because sometimes they move at the back and they cause uh, trouble at the back. So if you have children with you, brothers and sisters, please keep your children with you. Uh, also, before I hand it over to the sheikh, if you have parked in the car park or anyone else where you are blocking anyone else, make sure that you move your car so that... Whoever wants to leave, uh, they can leave, inshallah ta'ala. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to the Shaykh. فَلْيَتْفَضَّلْ مَشْكُورًا مَأْجُورًا أَلَى الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ نَحْمَدُهُ وَنَسْتَعِينُهُ وَنَسْتَغْفِرُهُ وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَمِنْ سَيِّئَاتِ عَمَالِنَا مَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّلَهُ وَمَنْ يُدْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Next week inshallah on Saturday at this time part of this series about the unseen is that we're going to deal with the issue of the signs of a good death May Allah Azza wa Jalla give all of us from those alamat. So, in dealing with this issue about death, which is another one of those wide and expansive issues that can be dealt with from many different angles, we are going to deal with some of the specific things that the Quran and the Sunnah have mentioned when a person is actually about to die. Things that we should know about. We would not have known about those things had it not been for the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. And we'll couple that, inshallah Azza wa Jal, with some of the many signs that are positive signs. If they were to be present at the death of a person, it would give an individual a good feeling that they are indications that he would be from the people of Al Jannah. Today, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, we want to really make this an introduction more than anything else to next week's talk because there's so much to deal with. Like we began our class yesterday about the etiquette of the masjid. Then which masjid are we talking about? Because there are many masajid in Al-Islam that have different etiquettes and different ahkam that uh, we need to know about. And that's the beauty of our religion. Al-Islam is a deep religion. It's comprehensive. It's easy to comprehend. It's easy to practice. But it doesn't mean that it is not 
filled with a lot of knowledge and a lot of information. So as Muslims, we believe and we think and we claim that this deen is the religion that Allah has chosen for mankind. So as a result of that, it's the religion that shows the proper way of life. The claim for the Muslim is Al-Islam deals with every single thing connected to the life and the death of human beings. So everybody who's here, from the beginning of your life to the end of your life, Al-Islam addressed every single issue that we need to know about and it didn't leave anything out. No one's going to come from this audience. No one's going to come from this city. No one's going to come from this country. No one's going to come from this dunya. And he'll present an issue and put it on the table and say, what does Islam have to say about this? Except that the Quran and the Sunnah, one of them or both of them, is going to have some specific direct instructions about what that situation is. No other religion can say that. No other human being can say that he has a way of life, a system that addresses everybody's issue and every issue connected to everyone. So if that's the reality of Al-Islam, then you can rest assured that as it relates to a person's death or his life all the way to the death, Islam is going to deal with everything before his life, during his life, at the time of his death, and after his death. It's just for the Muslim to come give it some time just to learn his religion. So today, inshallah, as I mentioned, is an introduction. There are some issues in Al-Islam that are more important than others. Most important issue being those issues that are connected to the asul of Al-Islam, the fundamentals. Those things that if you don't bring it to the table, you're excluded from being a Muslim. The things that Allah put a lot of emphasis on. The Prophet ﷺ put a lot of emphasis on. We won't say that there are some issues that are not important or they are insignificant, but all of the issues of Al-Islam are important, but some are more important than others. They're from the asul of the religion. The issue of death is from the asul of the religion. From many angles, it's from the asul of the religion. When in the famous hadith of Jibril, that's in Bukhari and Muslim, Jibril came to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and went through those questions, what is Islam, what is al-Iman, and what is al-Ihsan? And he answered all three questions. And then he said, when is the hour? When is the hour? When is the hour going to come in which everybody's going to die? No one is going to remain after that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, man mas'oolu anha bi'a'lama min as-sail. The one who is being asked a question knows just as much as the one who is doing the asking. Then he went on to ask him, well, give me some signs of the hour, the big death for everybody. Then the Prophet told him about some of those signs, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He left. He said, that was Jibril. He came to teach you your religion. So in that hadith, he talked about the fundamentals of the religion. And from those fundamentals is the question that Jibril put forth, when is Yom al -Qiyamah? Out of all of the questions that he could have put forth, Jibril was sure to put forth this question, when is the hour? No one knows when the hour is. No one knows when the big death or the small death comes. So when people hear the question and they hear the answer, the intelligent companions, the way they were, they say this is an important issue right here. That Jibril asked that question and he came to teach you the religion. So the issue of death is from the asul of the religion. Another proof of that is there wasn't a day that went by during the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and during the lives of his companions, radwanullahi alayhim ajma'in, except that he dealt with the issue of death every single day. And if a Muslim is following the sunnah, he or she should not see a day except that they're also dealing with this issue of death. And I'm not just talking about when someone dies. There are a group of youngsters. They have a WhatsApp group in which they made it their business to send out text messages on WhatsApp to let the community know when and where there's going to be a janazah. I think that's one of the most beneficial and intelligent WhatsApp groups that I'm aware of. 
The ones that don't waste time. This is one that doesn't waste time. All it does is inform the community. There's a janazah at any masjid here in Birmingham. Without concerning ourselves with what's the maslak of the mayit. Anyway, the Muslim, I'm not talking about he concerns himself with death when someone dies. Now he's concerned in his everyday existence within himself. He or she, if they're following the sunnah, if we're following the sunnah, the sunnah has taught us in the life of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he dealt with the issue of death and bringing it to the people's attention every single day in one way or another. From that, he told the people sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you wanted to pray, he says, Sallu salat muwadda ka'annaka tarahu fa'annaka illam takun tarahu fa'innahu yarak When you pray, and you pray every single day, he said, when you pray, Pray the salat of a person who's going to die. He's going to say bye and it's going to be his last prayer. He said, pray your prayer as if you see Allah. And although you don't see Allah, you know that Allah sees you. That's every day. The person should have that in his mind. As opposed to the normal prayer that the person just makes and he's saying, Alhamdulillah, at least I'm praying. Allah Akbar, he just prays. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do a lot of things. So that the people will come and make the prayer in a way in which they will come. So he told the people, don't run to the prayer. When you come, relax. Take it easy. Because if you're running, you get in the soft, you start praying, you start breathing hard. You're not concentrating on what you're doing. So from his instruction of the sunnah is, Sallu salatam muwadda. Pray the prayer of a man who thinks and feels, this is your last prayer. An example that I will give is what's real in America. People who are on death row. You get killed in some states. If you kill people, they're going to kill you in return. And they have some etiquettes as it relates to capital punishment over there. And one of the things that they do, whatever your religion is, you can have your imam, you can have your priest, you can have your rabbi come in and give you a prayer, whatever. And you can have your last words before they pull the switch or whatever they do to you. And they also give you your last opportunity to get your last meal. That's from their insania, za'amu. But anyway, if a person wants to pray in that condition, and he knows that he's going to get that electricity in his body after that prayer, he's going to pray a salat that's different from the prayer that we make. Where the person just gets up, he just gets up, Allah Akbar, and he just goes through it. And his mind is all over the place. So, this issue of death was something he dealt with every day. He told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, in another authentic hadith, when Anas ibn Umarik told him, Ya Rasulullah, give me some advice about the prayer. He told Anas ibn Umarik, radiyallahu anhu, uthkar al-mawt fi salatika, fa inna al-rajul, idha dhakar al-mawt fi salatihi, he said, Anis, whenever you're going to pray, then think and concentrate and contemplate about death. Because if a man were to think about death before he prayed, it would cause him to perfect his prayer. He used to tell the companion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Uthkuru dhikr hadam aladhat. Think about the destroyer of pleasures a lot. They said, what is the destroyer of pleasures like Ya Rasulullah? He said, it is death. So the point here, these few hadith are examples of the sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that goes to show every day the Muslim should be connected to this issue. And the tashahra tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibatu and that whole dua, at the last part of his dua, he used to tell the people that tashahada ahadukum if any of you make this dua, don't forget four things to seek refuge in Allah from. And one of them is every day, every prayer. Seek refuge in Allah Azza from the fitna of death and from the fitna of life. So with that being the case, it's not acceptable for a person to go a long period of time. He may have known or he didn't know, but now he comes to know. She comes to know now at this moment. It's not acceptable for a person to allow a day to pass him by except that we have to take stock of ourselves. And this is one of the benefits 
of being around people are going to remind you. And that people are going to help you to forget and encourage you to forget. Also from what shows us the issue of this type of lesson and this topic, this subject, is a subject from the asul of the religion. The most important aspects of Al-Islam. It's one of the primary issues in Al-Islam. Because the Prophet dealt with it every single day. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But also in addition to that, is what the scholars of Al-Islam did. In those books that we learn here, in those books that we encourage you people to learn, to purchase, to read, those books that show us how to be upon the sunnah, usul sunnah sharh sunnah all of those books that the scholars used to write. And all of those books that they used to call usul sunnah from the usul of the religion, the fundamentals of the religion, what the Muslim should believe in, how does he exist, all of those books without any exception, all of those books, they mention the issues that are connected to death, and the unseen. Like for an example, the people of the Sunnah, they believe in the two angels, Munkar and Nakir, who come to every single individual who died, Muslim or non-Muslim, and put forth to them three questions. This is in Usul sunnah that you have to believe that if you're a real Muslim, because some people come and say, well, I don't believe in that. How can an angel, how can his name be Munkar? Munkar means something that's bad. An amr bin ma'roof and a nahi and a munkar. Prohibiting was evil. The Nabi called him munkar, we're going to call him munkar. We're not going to waste time with philosophy. So the people of the Sunnah, they believe in that issue. They believe that, and put it in those books, if you're a real Muslim, when you die, there is the hellfire and there's the paradise. And there are things that are happening in both places. And there is the bridge or the sirat. And there is the hold or the fountain of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And all of those issues that are connected with death, those scholars of Al-Islam, they put it in those books, Asul al-Sunnah. Because the issue of death is from the most important aspects. Everybody is going to have to deal with it. Which brings me to the next point. And this next point that I'm mentioning, during the time of the companions, Ridwan Allahi alayhim ajma'in, they would be reminded of this point, but it was an easy point for them to comprehend. But during our time, because the understanding of the Muslims, the grasp of the Muslims concerning their religion, is in such a way during this time that it's hard for some Muslims to accept and embrace this issue that has been dealt with thoroughly throughout the Qur'an in many different ways. Allah Ta'ala could have just sent down one ayat that said the same thing. But he sent down multiple ayats that say the same thing in different ways about multiple issues. And anybody who sees that issue, that Allah dealt with that issue with many ayats, and they say different things, they come at you in different ways, is telling you this thing is important. Trying to grab your attention with these different ways. That this thing right here is important. And death is one of those issues. And one aspect of the death, our second point is, every single person is going to die except Allah Azza wa Jal. It's not acceptable for anybody who claims to be a Muslim to have any problem with accepting that. If a person rejects that basic, fundamental idea and principle, again, something's wrong with your Islam. You are either an extremely ignorant person, you're extremely astray, or you may be even outside of the religion of Islam if the proofs were given to you and you still insist on rejecting them. Because the Quran and the Sunnah clearly indicate in many ways. They instruct, they command you to understand, to know, to believe. Everybody's going to die. And no one was given eternal life. Not even the prophets or the messengers Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. And from that are the many statements of the Quran. Like the statement of Allah Ta'ala, Kullu man alayha fan wa yabqa wajhu rabbika dhul jalali wal ikram. Yawm al qiyamah, when that horn is blown, everybody on the face of the earth is going to die. And the people who lived before them are already dead. 
and they're in the Barzakh right now. But when that horn is blown, everybody on the face of the earth is going to die. And the only one who will remain, Allah will remain in the earth, as he said, he is the ilah in the sama, and he is the al-ilah in the earth. He is the God who should be worshipped in the sky. The malaika worship him in the heavens. And he is the ilah, the one who should be worshipped in the earth. Beni Adam and the jinn should worship him in the earth. It doesn't mean that Allah is in the earth. Allah is in the sama. Allah is over the sama. And he's not in the sama in the earth. But anyway, the ayah said, everybody is going to perish. And the only thing that's going to remain is the countenance of the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dhu al-jalali wal-ikram. Muslim can't come after that and say that there are exceptions to this rule. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in another ayat from the many ayats about this. Kullu shay'in halikun illa wajhuhu. Everything is going to be destroyed. It won't remain. Everything is going to be destroyed and the only thing that's going to remain behind is his face and the countenance of his face. From the many dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He made a lot of dua. And in many of his dua, he used to mention things like that. Allahumma laka aslamtu wa bika amantu wa alayka tuwakkaltu ila anqal anta al-hayy al-ladhi la yamut wal jinn wal ins yamutun. Oh Allah, you are the one that I believe in. And you are the one that I accepted Islam for. I submit it for you and I believe in you. And I rely on you alone. And he said a few other things. And then he said, you are the living. You're the one who lives. And the one who doesn't die. But all of the jinn and all of the mankind, they're going to die. And then someone comes and he says, no, Khidr didn't die yet. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't die. And he won't die. And he never dies. He may go to sleep. No. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has died. And those ayat of the Quran, and they are many, many, many. In the famous hadith, that I think we must have mentioned in this hadith over a hundred times. But it's so important. And it's one of those hadith that should be registered in the mind of every single young kid, every Muslim. When the Prophet died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Abu Bakr came and uncovered his face and smelt him and kissed him, he cried. He said, you smell good in death like you did in life. You taste good in death like you did in life. Came and got on the member and he told all of those companions, the ulama from amongst them, all of the companions, the adul from amongst them. There wasn't a single kathib or kadhab from the masjid, from the companions. All of them were adul, no fusaq, all good people, all of them. He said to them, radiyallahu anhu, and this is one of the pinnacle points in his history that showed everybody he's better than everybody else. He's more knowledgeable than everybody else. Because at this critical time, he brought this issue that needed to be understood. He said, Muhammad is dead. He's dead. And anybody who worships him, he's dead. As for Allah, Allah is alive and Allah doesn't die. So it may be an issue that some people from amongst you, alhamdulillah, you see it as a basic, easy issue. But unfortunately, in the city of Birmingham, the vast majority of these messages in this city don't believe that the Prophet died. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I'm not talking out of the side of my neck. I'm telling you, this is the reality of our ummah. This is where your relatives stand, many of your relatives. Your auntie, she's not a bad person. Your uncle, he's not a bad person. But in their mind, they think that that aqidah is the aqidah that Allah is pleased with. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he has died. Kullu nafsin da'iqatul mawt. Allah ta'ala mentioned in so many ayat. He told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tawakkul ala al-hayya al-ladhi la yamut, wa sabbih bihamdihi. Ay Muhammad. Rely on Allah. Rely on Him. And He's the one who doesn't die and glorify His name by Himself alone. Every soul is going to taste the death without any exception. There's one individual though from amongst Beni Adam that there is some kalam from the scholars of Islam based upon clear proofs 
who say maybe one person didn't die. And that was Musa alayhi salatu was salam. Who the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yawmul qiyamah, when the horn is blown, everyone's going to fall out and everyone's going to die. The jinn, everybody. And then the second horn will be blown and Rasulullah will be the first person who's going to be given life for yawmul qiyamah. And when he wakes up, he'll see Musa is already standing there. And from his virtues, the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from his fadail, I don't know if when the first horn was blown, Musa if he died or he didn't die, did he lose consciousness or not? I don't know. So he doesn't know the ilm al ghayb It doesn't connect it. It doesn't concern him. He doesn't know. But it doesn't reduce his position. But the Muslim is going to come. The vast majority of the masajid in Birmingham. The vast majority. The prophet knows everything and he didn't die. He said, I don't know. Was he exempt or he did die? And then Allah woke him up before me. Because he was exempt maybe when he asked Allah in the dunya to allow Allah him to see Allah and he lost consciousness. So we mentioned that issue a lot. That's the only issue that there is some kalam. Some of the ulama of Islam from Ahlul Sunnah say, will the malaika also fall out? And the strongest opinion and Allah's alam alam, everybody is going to fall out. Everybody. And the only one who isn't going to die is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because from his name and from his attributes is that he is al-hay as the prophet mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Before moving on, ikhwani, I want to repeat, I want to emphasize those of us who have parents and relatives who have problems with this issue we know and we understand that a lot of times the khutbah of Friday, I listened to the khutbah, I thought it was a really good beneficial khutbah actually, talking about the etiquette of ikhtilaf. That this man who's praying next to you may not be praying exactly the way you're praying. He may even be leaving things out from the sunnah that he should be doing. But that's not an issue for you two to become enemies to one another. And I think that's what the speaker was talking about. I'm pretty sure the speaker wasn't talking about Ikhtilaf and not following the sunnah is an easy thing because he made it clear. Shirk and innovation should not be tolerated. But when people fall into shirk or innovation, what we should do is deal with the issue in a nice way and not deal with it in a bad way. So there is this issue where some of our relatives, they do believe that the Prophet ﷺ didn't die because there are some proofs that you can understand like another issue that talks about death. All of the prophets who went before, they're in their graves and they are alive. And they are praying in their graves. The ayat of the Quran says, Don't think that those people who were killed in the cause of Allah are dead. Instead, they are with their Lord and your Lord is uh, providing for them. So these ayahs clearly indicate, clearly indicate the prophets and the messengers are alive in their graves praying. The shuhada, don't think that they're dead because Allah said they are alive. But the ayat of the shuhada, it also said, don't think those people who were killed in the cause of Allah. So the ayat established that they were killed. They were killed. But they're not dead. After being killed, Allah gave them a life. A special kind of life. That is between the dunya and between yawm al-akhir. And that is the barzakh. And that's part of what we're going to talk about in detail, inshallah, next week. But the people who hold on to that as a proof, we, we recognize what they're doing. But again, the companions didn't understand those ayat like that. The Prophet, all of his brothers from the Anbiya and the Rasul, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in, they died, but Allah gave them life, and they're praying in their graves, just like Fir'aun and other people who are now Muslims are alive in their graves being punished right now. So the point here is, easy with your parents, easy with your relatives, easy with the people who have these ideas. Don't be so quick to condemn people and as a result of the condemnation, we don't give them their hat of, give them dawah, 
in a nice and an easy way. Now we go to the next point about some of the introductory issues concerning death. And they are many. They are many. And that is, death is from the dominion of Allah Azza wa Jal, and it's from his domain and it's his property and his property alone. And this is something that Al-Islam places a lot of focus upon and doing this time that we're living with our youngsters and all of us. It was something that transformed the companions who embraced Al-Islam and made them much different than their compatriots who were in the peninsula of the Arabs at that time. The Arabs used to have different kind of understandings about death and what happened at death. They didn't believe in Yomul Qiyamah. They didn't believe that the soul would continue to live after that. They had a lot of things they believed and some things that they didn't believe. When they became Muslims, when they became Muslims, the non-Muslims from the peninsula, they were amazed at the Muslims because they were dealing with a group of people who, a group of people who were not afraid of them because of their tribe or because of their strength, their power, their money. Bilal ibn Rabah in Jahiliyyah, those people had the ability to make a person feel he was inferior because he's a slave or an ex-slave, because he has some physical ailment in the way that he's been created, he has some kind of handicap. So the people and the culture in the society had the ability to make a, feel, a person feel he's a second class citizen. Or to make the slave afraid of the sea, the, mess, the master. When they embraced the religion of Islam, and Islam put the most emphasis on the Tawheed of Allah more than anything else, and that you're responsible to worship Allah, and you're going to die, you're going to stand before Allah. And the emphasis on the Prophet ﷺ was an emphasis that said, and he is the path, he is the way that you will be guided. The emphasis was not upon him as such. And that's a very important lesson for death. That we shouldn't connect ourselves to any human being to the degree that if they live, we want to live. If they die, we want to die. If they do right, we'll do right. If they do wrong, we'll do wrong. Can't be like that. If that person were to die, what are you going to do? And if you know that everybody's going to die, how can you make your religion based upon this person's existence? I know people, not one, not two. I know a few people. The lady embraced the religion of Al-Islam because there was a Muslim man that she was interested in and he was interested in not. And they got married. And when he died, she apostated because Islam was connected to that person. The man, he became a Muslim because he wanted to be with the lady. When she apostated, he apostated. She became a Christian, he became a Christian. Our religion is not like that. A religion telling you the focus is on the Nabi Wasallam. We respect him, we honor him, we put him up, but he's the path and he's the way. And that's why from those many ayat that establish his death, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. There were many messengers who went before him. If he's die, if he dies, if he's killed, you're going to leave your religion. Anybody who leaves his religion, he doesn't hurt Allah one bit. And Allah is going to reward those people who are the thankful ones, they're thankful that they were guided. In this particular issue, when those companions became Muslims and they started to know about the Tawheed of Allah, Allah is the mighty, the powerful, the one who has the ability, and only Allah. And all of those ayats that tell about the creation and the alteration of the night and the day and what Allah did with the people of the past, all of this stuff in the creation, the mountains and all of that, and those people used to read the Quran, radiallahu anhum, and they knew the language. So they were getting knowledge. As a result of that, when it came time to fight the non-Muslims, the non-Muslims were meeting a force, they were meeting a foe, that they were at a loss because of the mentality of the people that were in front of them. So when the companion went to the Heracle of Rome or to the Qaisar, from Persia, he brought the letter of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and told him, this is the letter, Rasulullah is calling you to La ilaha illallah and to follow him 
and you'll get the reward if your people become Muslims. You'll go to Jannah. And the man read the letter. And the companion was disrespected by that man. And the companion said, it's okay. Because I left a group of people who love death more than you people love life. They're ready to die. And as a result of that, when the prophet would go to deal with his enemy, they would win and defeat the enemy by a month's journey. Today, today, the mawazin are different. So as a result of that, the imam in the masjid may be very afraid to say the truth. The Muslim at his job, he may be extremely afraid to show his Islam because he doesn't know. The young person, he's easily influenced. He's easily intimidated. And he's at the age where he shouldn't be intimidated like that because he knows about the Tawheed of Allah. And he knows his point that death is the property of Allah. Nobody can kill you if Allah doesn't want you to die. It's not the bullet that kills you. It's not the knife that kills you. None of that stuff can kill you. Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, Tabarakalladhi biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadiru huwa alladhi khalaq al-mawta wal alladhi khalaq al-mawta wal hayat liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala wa huwa al-aziz al-ghufur. Allah, bless it. Allah is blessed. He is the one who all of the dominion is in his hands. Both of his hands. Two right hands. And they are powerful and mighty. And they're responsible for creating everything. And he is the one who created death and he created life. To see which one of you is the best in your behavior. That's why we've been given life and that's why we're going to die. Who's oppressing who? And who's giving who their rights and so forth and so on. So... This is important, Ikhwani, because as we live right now in the West and we're dealing with these challenges, we're always telling people, avoid the extremes. Don't be an extremist where you give a bad name to Islam, but also the other side. Don't be a coward, neither. Don't be an individual who's afraid of the Muslims or the non-Muslims. The Nabi took Abdullah ibn Abbas in the famous hadith that's from his Jawami al kalam he took the young boy, 14, 15, 16, radiallahu anhu, he was young when the Prophet died. And from those words that he told him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa'alam, anna al-ummata, law ijtama'at, ala an yadurruka bi shay'in, lan yadurruka illa bi shay'in qad kataba allahu laka. Wa in ijtama'u, ala an yanfa'uka bi shay'in, lan yanfa'uka illa bi shay'in qad kataba allahu laka. وَإِذَا اجْتَمَعُوا عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَدُرُّوكَ بِشَيْءٍ لَنْ يُدُرُّوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبُوا اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ رُفِعَتِ الْأَقْلَامِ وَجَفَّتِ الْسُحُفِ Hey young boy, you have to know that if all of the people came together, white people, black people, Muslims, non-Muslims, Europeans, they all came together to benefit you. They can't benefit you except with what Allah Ta'ala is going to benefit you with because he owns everything. Them people don't own anything. And if they came together to hurt you, they can't hurt you. Except with what Allah Ta'ala has decreed. When the Muslim knows this in his aqidah, he's not a coward. Doesn't mean he's not going to be afraid when something happens, because it's natural to be afraid. But he won't cower when it's time to meet a challenge. The woman is the same way. She's going to get divorced. Life is not over for her. She's going to get divorced. She's not going to let that man keep her in the marriage because she's afraid she can't get married again and she has too many children. Her aqidah won't allow that to happen. Whatever the state is, whatever the challenge is, the Muslim is going to deal with that situation. That's one of the extremely and serious aspects of the study of death that the Prophet wasallam paid a lot of attention to with his companions. Another issue, from the muqaddimat of this issue, studying and being reminded and learning about a death as the Prophet brought it in the Kitab and the Sunnah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that people are dying every day and things happen every single day. We don't know always what's the wisdom behind that, what's the benefit behind it, but how many ayat of the Quran are there that clearly inform us? There are things that we don't like and Allah knows about those things and it is benefit. You don't know where the benefit is and you don't know where the harm is. 
You may think you have an idea, but Allah knows the reality. You think it's a small thing, but it's a big thing with Allah. You think the thing was this way, but it's a big thing with Allah. Death is like that as well. Death, no doubt, is a musibah. So when we hear people die, we say a particular dua. It's a big musibah. It happens. But still, it may be a lot of good in it. Because when people die, it's supposed to be a sign for us. It's supposed to be something that the living are going to take it as a sign. So Jibril came to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, hey, Muhammad, hey, Muhammad, live however you want to live because you're going to die and love whoever you want to love because you're going to part company with them. And as you do, you're going to be held accountable for whatever you put forward. So live however you want to live. Live right, live bad, however you want to live. And he only lived a good life. And love whoever you want to love because you're going to part company with that individual. Everybody going to part company. It's just the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So the Muslim, when he sees that these things are going on around him, and this is why we have this thing in our religion where we are highly encouraged. Don't be one of those people who, when there is a janazah, you're an individual who's lazy about going. No, one of the benefits of that janazah is just like this talk, maybe reminding you of something, it doesn't necessarily have to make you cry. doesn't necessarily have to make you afraid. But at least it reminds you to say, hey, I'm really not existing in the way where I'm really thinking of that. I got a lot of other things on my mind that may be important, but this is one of the most important issues that a person should be existing with. You're going to die. So be right by people and with people. You don't know when you're going to die. So make up with people, especially those people who you shouldn't be having these uh, problems with. So anyway, from the benefits of this death when it happens to other people, is that people have to make preparations. And in the West, it's important. Those of us who have relatives who are not Muslims and we die, they want to give us Christian funerals. Every single Muslim, as the Nabi mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't let three days go by without having your will. Don't die and you don't have a will. And your will doesn't have to be deep and it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be pretty easily pretty straightforward but many people don't consider this issue when we look at some of these things that are going on with some of the people they're just signs you're going to check out just like they checked out so make yourself prepared for that particular issue and that was something that the prophet ﷺ put emphasis on he didn't wait until a person died to tell them that he would just tell them he said to abu huraira radiallahu anhu don't let three days go by Abu huraira without Having a will and preparation for the death so that when you die, the people you left behind are not squabbling and they're not fighting and they're incurring sin upon themselves because you had something to do with not leaving the situation in a way that was pleasing to Allah and was crystal clear to them about what they did. That's part of the spectacle of death. So many issues are connected to it. Big issues that we know about. And issues we don't consider, we don't think about. And again, from the benefit of being around people going to remind you of your religion, is that when you forget, you get reminded. When you don't know, you are informed. As it relates to death. In our religion, Ikhwani, anybody who dies, we don't put those people in the hellfire. And we don't put those people in al-jannah. Except that we have some proof from the kitab or the sunnah. Or we have some proof where we're judging them based upon what is apparent. So when a Muslim dies, we take it at face value and we say that he's a Muslim. It's not our responsibility. What was he doing in the privacy of his home? It's not our responsibility. Was he really a munafiq? It's not our responsibility. Our responsibility in our minds as we exist is just to judge his situation based upon what is apparent. If he was claiming to be a Muslim, we saw from him and heard from him some Islamic things, we say, inshallah, he's going to be in Jannah ultimately. Inshallah, ultimately it's up to Allah. But we're not going to excommunicate him and we're not going to say he's in the hell fight. Allah knows best. Nor are we going to say about the Muslim, this person is definitely going straight to the Jannah and he's not going to the hell fight. We, we don't know that. So as it relates to death, there are those ayat of the Quran that prohibit us from exceeding the limits. Talking about Allah's religion without any knowledge, praying too much,
fasting too much, going and making the mujawaza of the hudud, going beyond the limits that have been ordained by Allah Azza wa Jalla. Maybe ayat, a number of hadith, and from them is this issue. It is overstepping the bounds for an individual to say about someone who died, this individual is in the hellfire or in the jannah, unless that person has some proof for the people who passed, or he's judging them based upon what is clear and what is apparent. There are some other issues, and they are a lot. They are a lot. No one should wish for death. As long as you're living, you shouldn't wish for death. You shouldn't misconstrue the many ahadith that encourage you to want to meet Allah. Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. Whoever hates to meet Allah, Allah hates to meet him. So the person is negligent with his life based upon this authentic hadith. He goes to Syria in order to get killed to meet Allah based on that hadith. And the hadith is not talking about that. No one who's alive should wish for death. لا يتمنين أحدكم الموت لدر نزل به فإن المؤمن لا تزيده حياته إلا خيرا None of you, he said in authentic hadith. No one should hope to die. No one should hope to die because of something that has happened to him. A catastrophe or a problem. Something is really bad taking place in his life and he hopes to die. He said no. He said because the believer, his life doesn't do anything except increase him in good. Again, as long as a person is on this top of the ground, he's on top of the ground. And not under the ground, he has a chance to make toba. He has a chance to do something. If you die, you're done. No more deeds, that's it. Other than some of those things are from the, uh, the sadaq jariyah. But who wants to rely on that? Person has his own opportunity to put good deeds forward from his own hands, from his own limbs. He doesn't wait in order for his children to make dua for him and so forth. That's an added attraction. But he himself has the opportunity. So that's part of what our religion is telling. So there are a number of ayat in the Quran. There are a number of ahadith that if a person didn't have knowledge, he would think that those ayat and those ahadith are encouraging you to be negligent and to lose your life. No. Allah wants people to live. But if you have to make that dua, if you have to for some issue, and you know your situation better than everybody else, the Nabi said, then you make a dua that is muqayyid. It's not open. Oh Allah, if life is better for me, cause me to live. If death is better for me, cause me to die. But no one, no one, and this is a problem that we get in this masjid. And the masajid of Birmingham. And that is how many people come to the office? How many people call the office? How many people have problems where those problems have people thinking about committing suicide. And I think everybody here knows someone who speaks like that, who feels like that, due to depression or something like that. The Muslim shouldn't exist like that. Death is not something that we should be trying to make it happen. If it happens, in the call of duty, it's going to come inevitably, but it's not something that people should short-circuit his own life and then as a result of that, he'll get a bigger punishment, a bigger problem than the one that uh, he is causing, that's causing him to desire this particular thing. So we're going to stop right here, inshallah, Azrajal, and next week for the good khatima, we'll deal with those issues of that long hadith that the Prophet told us, the details, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about what's going to happen to an individual when the angel of death actually comes to him. So we'll take about three questions at the most, four questions from you brothers, if you have them, and then we'll call it a day. Do you guys have any questions? Those of you want to leave, can you quietly leave? Tafadli ya akhi. Brothers asking those malaika that are close to the arsh, which are eight angels as the Quran mentioned, will they also die? Allah alam, there's ikhtilaf, but it appears everything is going to not exist except Allah azawajal, except Allah, 
And Allah is not in need of the Arush, nor is he in need of those angels to carry the Arush. So there's no Ishkal and there's no Mu'arat from that. It's not like they're carrying the Arush and Allah is in need of them because he is Al Ghani, Al Hamid. Is it permissible to ask for death on Hajj or Umrah? It's permissible for a person to make dua to die in a particular way or in a particular place. That's permissible. The Prophet وسلم, told the people in the authentic hadith, Man minkum in yamut bil Medina, falyafal. Any of you people who have the ability to die in Al Medina, then do it. فَإِنِّي آتِنْ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةَ شَفِيعٍ لَهُ I'll come يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةَ and I ask Allah to allow you to go to paradise. I'll be a um, intercessor for you. So a person can say, Oh Allah, cause me to die in Mecca. Cause me to die in Medina. Cause me to die performing Hajj or Umrah. But it's just a general dua. The hadith about this issue is clear. إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ The deeds will be judged by the last things that you do. So if a person dies, when he dies, he's going to be judged by the very last thing that he was engaging himself in. So if he was in a masjid before he died, that's going to be in his scales. It's a good sign. If he was fasting, if he was in Mecca, making Umrah, making Hajj, it's a good sign. But don't get the two confused. Making dua to ask Allah to give you a good death at a good place or a good way is one thing. But don't make dua, Allah, I want to die. Cause me to die. I want to die today. Make me die today. You shall live. خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ طَالَ عُمْرُهُ وَحَسُنُ عَمَلُهُ The best of you is the one who lived a long time and he had good deeds. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Help me because I can't really see. Fadiyah. Death of who? As we mentioned, Ikhwani, doing the daros, the people who say that the Prophet ﷺ is not dead, we all have to agree that he's not dead. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that the prophets and the messengers are alive. And the Quran and the Sunnah show us that people who have died, they're still alive right now. So we say he's not dead, but we say that he died. He died based upon the Quran. He died based upon the Sunnah. Based upon the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتْ وَإِنَّهُ مَيِّتُونَ You're going to die, Muhammad, and they're going to die. How could someone come now and say, no, you didn't die? وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشْرًا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ الْخُلْدَ أَفَإِنْ مِتَّ for whom al Khalidun? We have not given any human being before you, Muhammad, eternal life. So if you were to die, do these people, Kufab Quraysh, think that they're going to live forever? All of you are going to die. Wherever you people are, death is going to come to every one of you. Even if you try to escape and go up on a tall tower. You go under the water, under the earth. The death is going to get you. Malik and Mot is going to come and get you. No matter where you are. So these people hold on, as we mentioned, to Shubahat. That they see as being proofs. But they're Shubahat. Now, when the Prophet made Al-Isra and Mi'raj, he was alive. He wasn't dead in the first place. He was living. And he came back from Al-Isra and Mi'raj. And he was walking around. 
He lived 12 years after Al Isra al Miraj. 12 years. As for him being in his grave, and we say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, upon him, the Malaika take that tomb in his grave and he gives it back to us. And we believe that. How can he give it back to us if he's dead? No, he's giving it back to us because he's alive after dying. And this is the issue that our brothers and contemporaries tend not to understand. But again, in the issue of ikhtilaf and the etiquette of ikhtilaf, there's no room to tolerate kufr, shirk, and takvib of the Quran and the Sunnah. But I have to understand, this is a shubha from the shubahat. Take it easy. Take it easy with the person. He just, he's misunderstanding the issue. We hate that misunderstanding. We don't like it. We don't look at it as being small. But he doesn't mean it with evil and negative intent. And he has those shubahat. Just have to uh, educate him. My little man had a, his hand up over here. Some little brother over here. We don't want to leave him out. I thought I saw some little guy over here. Go ahead, little man. When a person dies, does he feel pain? Allahumma naam, he's going to feel some pain. If he's from those people who are going to get punished. Terrible pain. But if he's from the people who die doing certain things, he won't feel any pain. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the person who fights for al-Islam in the right way, in the right jihad, in our religion, the right way, and he gets killed defending this religion, when he gets a wound, the wound that kills him is only going to feel like the pen if he got stuck by the pen. That's it. That small thing, the pen. Again, which goes to show, the Mawazin, the Mawazin, the scales in Qalaba, they're different. The companions, they heard that the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you get killed, Fi Sabilillah, the guy get you with a sword, chop your neck off, chop your arm off, and you bleed to death. He said, all you're going to feel is a prick from the pen. So to them, they were not afraid of a prick from the pen. One of us goes to the hospital and they're going to take blood. The guy has to turn his face away. And some people even faint. And I'm talking about men. He faints. And his wife is looking at him and saying, what's going on? How are you going to protect me if something happens? How do we know that the person is going to feel it if he's a bad guy? The very first thing that happens in his grave, when he's asked, who's your Lord? What's your religion? What do you have to say about that man who came to you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And then Allah, Azawajal, that person, he can't answer the question. He says, I don't know who my Lord is. I don't know what my religion is. I heard the people saying something. I said the same thing. The malaika will tell him those two angels, Munkar and Nakir. You didn't read about your religion. So you didn't know. You don't know the answer because you didn't take the time out to learn. Rasulullah said that they're going to pick up an iron pipe. And they're going to hit that guy in the back of his neck. And already the back of your neck is a sensitive area. You don't want to get hit in the back of your neck. You get knocked out easily. You get concussed easily. They're going to hit him in the back of his neck with an iron pipe. And he's going to scream out. Rasulullah said, if you people were allowed to hear the screams of the people in the kabur, you wouldn't bury your dead because you'll be afraid to put them down here. Maybe they're going to be punished like that. So that's one of the proofs that the dead person is going to be punished. And they're going to be punished in the hellfire while they're living. So when you die, you're going to feel it. And also, while a person is living, while a person is in his grave, there's going to be the adab, he's going to be punished in the cover. The Nabi said every single person, every Muslim, good and bad, everybody, when he's put in the grave, He's going to be crushed. Everybody. Even if he's from the awliya. Everybody. Half of the book Quran. The best and the worst of the people. He's going to be put in that grave. And he's going to be crushed. To the point that one of the size of his ribs is going to go to the other one. He's going to be crushed like that. He said if there were someone to escape that. It would have been Sa'd ibn Mu'adh ibn Ubadah. It would have been him. But even it happened to him. It's going to happen to him. 
So the Nabi told the people, seek refuge in the adab of the qabr. Because even the good person has to go through that. And the Muslim, being a person who submits his will to what Allah wants, and he believes in what Allah is sending his messenger, he doesn't sit there and say, why, why, why? He has to try to find out. What did the scholars say? If you're going to go to Jannah, Jannah is a reward that you didn't deserve. You don't deserve no one. You didn't do enough to deserve the Jannah. But Allah puts people in the Jannah because of His Rahmah. And before they go into Jannah, that special place in it is what no eyes have seen, no ears have ever heard. You can't even imagine what's in it. It's only open and accessible to people who are pure and clean. And we did a lot of stuff in this dunya. We did a lot of stuff in this dunya. So when a person goes through that, and then he doesn't get punished, he got cleaned up for what he did or what he didn't do at a particular time during his life. And it makes him from the people who deserve to go to a Jannah. Because he's been cleaned up to go into the Jannah. So yes, little man, people will be feeling pain and punishment in the hell fight. One of the punishments of the kuffar is that every time the hellfire burns their skin, Allah is going to replace them with more skin so that it keeps getting burnt. Plus, they're going to choke from the fire, from the smoke. Plus, the heat is going to bother them. Plus, the people are going to be screaming. Plus, there's going to be water and liquids on them, molten brass, going to be balling them. Plus, they're going to have to eat from the tree of Zarqum. Rip their insides out. When you eat from this tree, it's going to rip your insides out. So it's a lot of punishments that people can't fathom for the bad people. As for the good people, they are also, also going to have trials and tribulations. It's a day of being afraid. Death is not easy. So we have to seek refuge in Allah Azawajal, from the fitna of the adab of the qabr and the fitna of al-mawt and things like that. And ask him not to cause us to go to the hellfire or to be punished or asked any questions. Okay, Khwani, we're going to stop here, inshallah, Azawajal. And we ask Allah to put your sitting here in your muazin of Hasanat Yom Al-Qiyamah. Encourage you to come to the program next Saturday as well. Jazallah, Shaykh, and khair al-jaza. Uh, just before, inshallah, you leave, just wanted to remind you as well, we have, uh, as part of the second, the second part of the series of the stories of the prophets, we have a lecture on Friday, inshallah ta'ala, by our Shaykh Abu Usama al-Dhahabi, and the title will be uh, The Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And with that, we will conclude, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, subhanakallah, bihamdika, shadu Allah, ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayka.